during our old times in Berlin, where we actually recited them every day, to the beautiful effect that we actually memorized all those verses, you know. It was very nice. You know, if you memorize somebody something every day, then, then it's very nice. Today our discussion is a very delicate discussion, discussion because yesterday was a sadhu that when you attach to Krishna or to the sadhu, the doors of liberation open automatically. So next verse is also from Shiva Bhagavatam 325-21. It says, Tadarajas Tamo Bala Kama Loba Dayas Chaye Chitai Tair Anavidam Shtitam Satre Prasidati Titik Shava Kurunika. And this is funny. It's very funny here. Yeah. <laughs> it's very funny, he put one verse in Sanskrit, but the translation is from another verse. <laughs> I think our Harada had a, a little slip here in his attention. <laughs> So that when you are under the modes of the pure nature, then Kamaloba, lust and greed, they will become very strong. So we have to become sadhus. That means we have to become tolerant. Uh, a sadhu, the symptoms of a sadhu are that he is tolerant, merciful and friendly to all living entities. He has no enemies. He is peaceful. He abides by the scriptures and all his characteristics are sublime. That's a, that's a high, high stake, no? So you think about this, are you tolerant? I mean, tolerant means do you maintain your peace of mind when they provoke you? Not just because things are a little different than you expect, but if you're actually provoked, are you tolerant? Next question, are you merciful? Are you strict with yourself and merciful with others? Or are you strict with others and merciful with yourself? Hmm? Well, that would be a, a misunderstanding. So you should be merciful with others and strict with yourself. No, I, I personally realized that 
being strict with others, that is something which we just, it, it, in the end it take, it causes you harm. You should always help others, accommodate others. You should do something like that, you know, uh, because they may not, the other people, they may not be so strict yet about certain practices. So what? It says in the, in the one of the slokas of Srila Rupa Duswami, Yena Tena Prakarena Mana Krishna Nimesha Yet. First and foremost principle of all, think of Krishna. How to get others to think of Krishna. This is a crucial element. That is the essence. How to get the other people to think of Krishna. I think this system fails. Uh, no, 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 don't worry about it. Don't worry. It's about the recording. I can, I can talk without it. So. So that was the tolerant, the merciful aspect. That we should be merciful with others. That uh, first, you, first and foremost of all the religious principles to think of Krishna. Most important. Think of Krishna. Then gradually the rules and regulations can be introduced. Like I was telling one devotee this morning, I don't really like prohibitions. I like people to understand things and act according to them, to their understanding, to their conviction. Of course, the scriptures, they say, this is not good, this is not good, that other thing. But we have to understand something is not good and then stop it. Because we want to stop it. Like, for example, the four regulative principles. Really nobody told me in my life that I should follow them. I, I follow them because that's what I wanted to follow. I wanted to be free of drugs. So I stopped taking drugs. Even before I came to the Prabhupada, it was a decision. I didn't want to be a drug addict, so I stopped. And I didn't want to have a child without a marriage, and also not with marriage, so I didn't get married. So I said, Good. don't want to have a child, then you can have sex, otherwise you would have to do all kind of cheating processes or to the sexual intercourse. And I want to speak of leaving a woman alone with a child somewhere. No, thanks. I didn't want that. So I didn't want that. That's why I didn't, didn't engage in this way. I didn't want to eat meat. There's <laughs> no question. I, no, you bring a piece of meat and says you eat it, you know, I, I feel like you want to kill me or something, you know. So again, this wasn't forced upon me. This came to me. This is wrong. shouldn't do it. I don't want to do it. Since 15, I never ate a piece of meat. Thanks, Krishna, he had gave me that insight. And gambling, what a boring, stupid thing. So, <laughs> we, in, we had one lady in Ecuador, we asked her, so, do you want to follow the, the foreign principle? She said, yes, I like to. Because whenever I gamble, I lose all the money. Whenever I eat, say, eh, whenever I eat meat, I get sick. And when I
was a little joke. Uh, translation didn't work out too good. Uh, anyhow, so so if the rule the rules should come to us, even getting up from a galart, you know. I mean, in the temple I tell the devotees, I don't fight with you for the art. You have to get up to the Mount Art because you want to. But if you don't come to class, then you shouldn't eat Prashad. Because otherwise, if you don't listen to the class, you're not in the community. I mean, it's a different thing, you're not coming to class because you're doing service in the time of the class. But otherwise, there's a class. The class is what keeps us together as a, as a, as a community. If you don't listen to the class, you don't care about like the announcements and the social interaction with others, then you're not part of the community. So there we, there we, for those who live in the temple, I'm very strict with this. <coughs> Let's say I'm trying to be strict because what can you do, you know? What can you do, you know? You don't want to fight with people. Why didn't you listen to Shema Bhagavatam? You're nonsense. This is also it's an unpleasant thing, you know. But then again, if you don't have any discipline, then the whole thing goes to hell. So we have to convince people to we have to convince people to come to class. So they have to want to come to class. Now, if I want to live in a community, then I should also want to come to class. Then if you're somebody, I'm living in a community, not because I care for the community, just because cheap living, comfortable environment, and so and so, I have something. It, it's, yes, that maybe, maybe get the free gift of Krishna for that. But even then, for the sake of the community, you should submit to the basic discipline of coming to class. Maybe somebody is in the community because he, he couldn't find another place to live and he, he likes it. Okay, and then give support to the community. <coughs> then don't be a disturbance to the community. Don't exploit the community. I mean, if that's your conditioning, Narada Muni, he didn't choose to live with the sadhus. He lived with the sadhus because his mother was a maidservant of the sadhus. And then he ate their remnants and became a devotee and, and then he became Narada Muni. I mean, so it worked for him. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it's like uh, <coughs> special grace is given. But living in a community, you should support the community. Living in a house, living in a family, you should give some, some very good help. But you should understand that it shouldn't be by force. So there's like a middle way. And the middle way you have to you have to find out. That's why also the, the word disciple comes from discipline. <coughs> well, it has to be a discipline. But the discipline of Vaishnavas is the loving transaction of convincing others of what they are doing. I don't want to be surrounded by people doing things they don't like to do. That's hellish. You come to class. Yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> Take a shot. It's horrible. So we, we are living community means we believe in a common common ideal, common goal that makes our life joyful. So this is this is uh, this again the 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 next qualities to be friendly to all living entities. Uh, in German, merciful is barmherzig. It's a very strong word. Have a good heart for everybody. Merciful. 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 I want to help you. Regardless what. Merciful, you, you don't impose yourself to anybody while you're merciful. You're, <coughs> you're extending yourself to somebody. You're extending. Where do you need me? How do you need me? 
and then friendly to all the main entities. I mean, this is a sadhu's quality. Here, we are learning how a sadhu conducts himself in a community. And this is a sum and substance because we live in a community or we visit a community. Even this mela is a community. It's a temporary community. We're just sharing four or five days. But those days, so beautiful days, so 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 beautiful setting, extraordinary, can only be said. In all this connection, we can only say, my goodness, how God has given us such a nice community, but it has a price. Everything has a price in life. And community has a higher price than living by yourself. Like some person said, I never fight with anybody. I said, with who do you live? I live by myself. Because <laughs> uh, you don't fight with anybody. <laughs> uh, very, very smart. Huh? Huh? But in a community, then you have to show, don't become angry. Be friendly with everybody. Be comforting. So then, the next thing is, he has no enemies. Why should I be subtle with enemy? If somebody else is not doing what I'm doing, there's no reason that he's becoming my enemy. So this is, uh, this is the freedom of thought principle, the freedom of, of uh, conviction. You know, we, we believe in the freedom of thought, 100%. Most people don't believe in it 100%. But we believe in social interaction. So that is called Shravanam Kirtan. Hey, what are you doing there? It's not good. Oh, why is it not good? It's not good for you. Let me explain to you. It's for this reason and that reason and that reason and that reason and that reason. The other person said, really? I didn't know about that. Yes, it's really true. You can investigate. I'm not making it up. It's very, very essential that you also understand that. So that we convince each other. And if somebody is not convinced, well, then he has to go his way. Even, even in this world of... Uh, if somebody kills a human being, then he's thrown into jail. If somebody kills an animal, he's getting the karmic reaction. And of course, if somebody tortures an animal, he can also be put in jail for that. There's, there's rules, there's laws against torturing animals. If somebody does harm to the mother nature, there's a lack of laws. There are some laws, but you say, like for example, if I buy a piece of land. How, how deep a hole am I allowed to drill into the land? Hmm? They haven't really, they have no laws for that. They haven't thought about that, but they should. Like if I'm on the land and the river goes by my land, so, or goes in the middle through. Now the river is mine because it went into my land. I can keep all the water for me. After, after my next, so they have water laws, river laws, they have some laws, but not environmental protective laws. And if they have them, they don't enforce them. That's why we're working on the subject of the laws of nature, the rights of nature. This, this is one of the reasons, because it's a, it's a disaster. Like if I say, I, I have a piece of land, I, I bought it, now I want to make a hole to the other side of the world. <laughs> well, who tells you that I can't? Huh? So, there, there has to be consideration. This is an extreme example, but example or not example, you know. People, people own mountains and they sell the entire mountain. It's a very common practice. You find that in many places. And they have a mountain and they're just cutting and cutting it and they're selling it as construction materials. It looks horrible. It changes the climate, it changes the bio, biosphere. No, so this is a very serious decision, but you see that in many parts. No? They, they're calling that, now they say that they're getting a license. Before nobody asked for a license, now maybe you have a license. How do you get a license to, to destroy a mountain? 
Now, according to Vedic culture, even much less because according to Vedic culture, the mountain has a soul. No? No, so you're not supposed to, to cut a mountain. And it's, you know, the nature has its own, that, like said, the, the saying is God forgives, but nature does not forgive. Nature, nature goes stringent, the stringent laws of nature.
Yesterday we had a very inter interesting discussion about our modern world, which I will explain to you a little later after finishing this, because it's also about the enemy subject. Then he is peaceful. A Vaishnava, a son, is always equiposed. Yes. He doesn't gotta get upset with anybody else. If somebody else misbehaves, he tries to correct him, if it's possible. But he's not getting, he doesn't get out of his peaceful disposition. Okay. Because when we get very agitated ourselves, it doesn't help. I mean, sometimes there's things we really don't agree with. Why not? You have a right not to agree, but then how to go about it? It's very, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult topic, but it's, it's something, it's called interaction between human beings. And there we have like the Ishtagostis, the Ishtagostis, then if there's a real big problem, we go to the Guru and we present our plight to him in the case of a Vaishnava community. <coughs> it's very pleasant, it's a very good system. He abides by the scriptures. That's a very, very elevated expectation. He abides by the scriptures. What does that mean? Huh? That means a lot. But we could almost say he abides by the community. Uh, the Vaishnava rules established in the community. That's basically what we can say because they abide by the scriptures. The scriptures have so many instructions, no? And they have instructions. Yes, he abides by the scripture means he's submissive to the Sanatana Dharma. That, that's the way. Submissive to Sanatana Dharma. But even that may mean different things in different places. Like in Sanatana Dharma, it may mean in some place in the world that you should learn Sanskrit as a child. I did. Uh, you should understand all about puja, uh, about samskaras. That's part. Well, that's Brahminical training. Well, do you want to be a Brahmin? Well, so it's, it's not so easy. What does it really mean to abide by the scriptures either? So you have to basically abide by the tradition of Sanatana Dharma as it is brought to you by your Guru in your community. That's basically what we could say abide by the scriptures. And all his characteristics are sublime. Well, that's a very high expectation that the characteristics are sublime. I mean, the word sublime means how is it translated in German? Sublime. Yes, good. Character eigenschaften sind erhaben. Erhaben, erhaben means very high. Uh, something erhaben. Say, I don't know what is the, the etymological root of erhaben. You know. It has the meaning of to have something and to have something higher. To have something higher than others. I mean, so er hebt sich über andere. Sublime is a different word in English, but in the sense, really, it's the same. Exalted. So, mm -hmm. Superior, elevated. Yes, sublime. But sublime or erhaben? Erhaben. Yeah. Look what sublime says. Erhaben. Hmm? Erhaben. Okay. Look what sublime. Sublime means in German, in sublime etymological root. Uh, sublime, in the, in the way it's used in the English language, it just is top excellent, divine. Sublime touches with divine. You cannot say sublime materially. It's very. You can't say, he's a sublime uh, sportsman. It doesn't fit. Sublime is a really very high word. So, sublime. So, you want to be sublime, you're expected to be sublime. 
That's a very high expectation, you know. That's like, my God, you know. It almost say he lives like a saint. No? <laughs> Living like a saint. It takes a saint to live like a saint, no? So, in that way, is really a, a question a question how much are we able to, to fulfill that expectation of Suridam Sarvabhutana. Uh, it's, it's, it's a goal. You have to understand these instructions, this is our goal. So we, we can try to make this our goal, but we cannot say, hey, you are not sublime. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You know. uh, cannot say that. How is it going to be sublime? Only sublime people are sublime. Only pure people are pure. Only learned people are learned. I say, hey you fool, why you're not learned? Well, because I didn't learn it. <laughs> so what do you want me to do? <laughs> huh? Hey, why don't why you're not running hundred meters in ten seconds? Huh? In one minute. Uh, why not? Well, I'm sorry, I can't. Oh, then you're useless? No. It's not at all. So it's like a thing, you know. How much you expect another person, how much you train another person, how do you motivate another person? Like people ask me, how do you manage this, this Krishna conscious family? I have two answers to that. Number one is, I have no answer. Huh? And number two is, I beg. I'm a beggar of love. I beg people, please help me. I can't do it myself. There's so much to be done. Please be so kind. Help me. Get involved. It's very wonderful. We need you. Let's do it. I beg the young people. I beg the old people. I beg the men. I beg the women. I beg the visitors. I beg everybody. I beg. I'm a beggar of love. That's all I'm doing. I'm not bribing anybody because I got no money to bribe. And I, I, I'm not threatening people because I don't like that way and I don't think it's the way to get people to do something. Mm -hmm. But I, I use the power of words because I've been given a, a mouth to speak and a heart to feel and a brain to think. And for some reason and some arrangement, divine arrangement, sometimes people listen to me. So in this way I say, okay, here, here you are, this is what I feel, right? Like right now, no? Right now I'm begging you, I'm, I'm begging you to become like what this verse says. I didn't write the words, it's from Srimad Bhagavatam. I love the words, and I think it was well-picked words for reading today, for our, our morning class, it's really substantial, it really makes us reflect upon what we are doing, what we are trying to accomplish, but this is, I'm just a beggar. And I'm a beggar and I think in that way, as far as convincing other people to do something, you are also a beggar. That's all you can do. And you can beg people according to your conviction as well. If I beg you to do something I don't want to do, that wouldn't be very fair. If I say, Oh, I'm taking drugs every day, but I beg you not to take drugs. Then you will say, are you a lunatic or what? Huh? Why, you, why you ask me to do something which you are not doing? So, so in this way, I, I ask people, please don't have illicit sex. Uh, because I'm sorry, I don't believe to illicit sex is anything good or we should we do that, I don't believe in it. I really think that I really think that sex is holy. It's a very sacred, holy thing. I for me sex is so important, it's so incredible, so worshipable that I don't have it. <laughs> huh? Something something like that, you know. <laughs> or you think bad about sex, or you think bad about people with sex? No. No, not at all. I don't think it's an issue. I think it's a, their decision whether they're married. Of course, if they're having sex and they're not married, it's another. It's an objectionable thing. But why is it objectionable? 
because of the potential of suffering caused to others due to their sex life. If they're going to have a child and they don't want to have the child later, there's going to be so much suffering. So I will, I will distance myself from that. I would say, no, I don't agree with it. You should not have sex life outside of marriage and without the purpose of having a beautiful child. But if you do have a beautiful child and if you have that marriage and that sex life is worshipable. I mean, we don't make an article to it because it would look really crazy, you know. But this sex life, let's say physically, a couple is having sex life. And in that sex life, a pure devotee is going to be produced. I could make an article to that sex life. It's Krishna himself. It's not pornography. Of course, we keep it in a different section, no? but fact, matter of fact, the moment a pure devotee appears into this world, what, what's wrong with that? We worship that. The natives in South America, they say the sexual organ is the sacred organ. It has to be totally protected from abuse. I love that when I heard that, when I heard Luntana say that. No? El organo sagrado. Yes, it's, it's a sacred organ. I mean, you can spit as much as you want, nothing will grow from it. But from your genital, one semen comes, a new life can come. So, <laughs> therefore, we could say the genital is more sacred than the mouth. Of course, from the mouth you can, you can uh, bring good words. From your spit, nothing is going to come. But from your words, maybe something good is going to come. Uh, and from your ear, where well, nothing is coming from your ear except a little wax. Uh, but something can go inside the ear, and it's a different subject, no? And from your eyes, again, nothing comes from your eyes, but your eyes are good for taking in information. So here you go. Eyes, ears, mouth, and genital. Sacred organ. Not because you go to the bathroom. Okay, that's also good. Otherwise, if you don't go to the bathroom, where are you going to keep all this stuff inside? That won't be a problem, right? So the Lord has made an arrangement of discharge. <coughs> I see Ishavas is saying, what is he talking about here? In the middle of the class. <laughs> but, you know, stool is a very good thing, you know. And the best thing about it is that we can pass it. And then if you are smart enough, we can turn it into fertilizer and not contaminate the water with it. We did that in, in Chakri Mine, in some of our farms. We learned how to turn stool into great fertilizer with worms and mixing it with kitchen, uh, kitchen uh, remnants and so. The worms love it and turn it into humus. And you know humus, you go to the garden, you go to the garden shop and see how much humus you have to pay for a bag of humus. It's very expensive stuff. So we can turn our stool into humus with a little work. That's all, a little work. So rather than contaminating the waters, no? Some people say, but the dry toilet, I find it very strange. But it's not strange. Strange is to shit into the water. That's strange. It's one of the last, but we think, no, we have our modern toilet, la, 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 la. And we have our septic tanks, okay, okay. You have a septic tank and you do it well, and that may be an acceptable situation. I mean, of course it's acceptable because it's been accepted everywhere. But is it the best system? I don't think so. I think the best system is a dry toilet and to make humors with this. Because this humus is what the earth requires, a return of the good quality of things. We have a problem nowadays, like yesterday I wrote in a paper, uh, it says, we have the biggest cheating in the world, it's called organic agriculture. They are using for fertilizing their lands, the stools from animal factories. But animal factories don't produce organic manure because the manure is contaminated by all the garbage and junk which they feed the animals. 
So what you call organic menu, because it's stool from animals, is not organic and it is this this permaculture type of organic food is a cheating. It's still full of the chemicals which we try to get rid of. So, but they don't have a regulation system to control the fertilizer quality where it is coming from. And as a matter of fact, most of the fertilizer does come from mass animal keeping ins installations. Means that's where the fertilizers come from. When you see them, they are on the fields. You know, they come with the big things and they spread the, the gülle everywhere. Well, what is that gülle? That's not organic. That gülle is already contaminated. And it stinks and it goes in the ground and it contaminates the... the so we are really... We, we have created a big mess. I mean, I don't always want to talk about the environment, but it's just the way I can't get around it. It always comes back to it, always comes back to it. Yeah. Now we're just talking about sacred organs, and here we go back to the environment, you know. Uh, because that's also, that's animal stool, then it's as human stool. We have to deal with stool, and we have to manage stool proper, properly. But, but that's one thing, the stool and the urine. But salmon is not stool and urine. Salmon is life-giving power, power energy. It's ojas. It's, it's something very incredible which is being created by God himself. And that ojas or, or this salmon power brings about wonderful guys like Gora Hali, no? God, no? Huh? What a beautiful power is there in this in this having children, you know, look at those little kids we are having here. We are blessed in this Mela. So many beautiful kids have come. This Mela is fully alive by all the children and we have to have beautiful programs with them. I want to have a meeting with all the kids today. Let's come together and do something wonderful together. Because this is really wonderful to have all these children here. So. This is the power of life, and it is by the power of the sacred organ. So that's why we worship the sacred organ. And we want to protect it. And the way to protect it is by chastity. And the way to protect it by respect. And so in this way, women are carrying the children in the womb. In their own belly, they have not only a sacred organ outside, also inside. The entire inside of a woman is meant to bring life, another person into life. So the womb is such a sacred thing. Huh? It's not a bag of a bag of, of skin and meat. No, the womb is the receptor, the receptor of life. In that womb, the woman's food is turned into baby food. <laughs> huh? and, and making the cells, I mean, the system is so miraculous, so marvelous. If you think what's going on inside the belly of a woman when she's in, uh, in gestation, I think that's the word in English, is it? In, if she's in pregnancy, What's going on in her belly is so incredible. That's why people say, oh, look at her belly, it's big now. And then you, you can even maybe feel <coughs> guys kicking, no? Uh, little babies <coughs> kicking inside the belly, no? So, and the father is looking, oh, what's happening? <laughs> what's happening? It's going, going, going. My, my child inside. What an experience to become a father. Unfortunately, the men nowadays, they're so brute. They can't see it, they can't appreciate it. I mean, I'm talking about those fathers when they are not taking care of their children afterwards. Not talking about the good fathers who love their children and raise them. But, you know, your child. Hey, that was you. You? No, it wasn't me. Well, who was it? Well, the semen is under God's control. Life is under God's control. Only a person gets born by God's grace. But, by God's grace, and you were there. You were part of the deal. Right? 
can't say anything about what you were part of the deal there. Huh? So now you have to think, my God, what, how to deal with this? Huh? You got Dharma. Having a child is Dharma, is Sanatan Dharma. There's nothing about having a child, doesn't matter in what culture, in what religion, a child is Dharma. And a precious Dharma. And to fulfill that Dharma. Look, his mother is so lucky. She brought this guy into this world, no? So that's why I'm very grateful with the parents of the devotees, no? My God, you brought this guy into this world? What to speak if there are devotees bringing devotees into this world, no? Can you imagine, you know? Goloka Jailalita. My God, Dropani. How did you bring these children into this world? Huh? Incredible, no? Vishaka bringing her children into this world, Gopinag. So I, I'm deeply impressed, and, and even the, the of not even the, the parents of the devotees who are not devotees, they, I, I have so much regard for them. They are so fortunate. One time I was talking with Sadhu Maharaj and he was talking about my father. Sadhu Maharaj met my father and, and, and I said, mm, yeah, my father is pretty tough, he's not so inclined towards devotional life. And, and Sadhu Maharaj looked at me. He already did his service, he brought you. Of course I didn't agree with him because I'm not good for that. Uh, but. Uh, I, I wouldn't say my father is okay because I'm a devotee, but just forgetting about me and my father, just on general. Uh, I mean, Sadhu Maharaj made a good point there. He said that if you're in Krishna conscious, means your parents have done a great service for Prabhupada. They raised you, they brought you into this family. And that means they're getting, you know what Prahlad Maharaj said? Huh? Ten generations to the past and to the future, they're all going back home, back to God, and if a pure devotee comes into somebody's family. So, my dear friend, you, you can do the best for all your ancestors by becoming pure devotee. That's what the scriptures say, that's what Prabhupada told us. As a matter of fact, if you are <laughs> worshipping Lord Krishna, you don't have any other debts with others because your other debts are cleared out when you're doing service for Krishna and Sri Guru. That is the high elevation of Guru Seva. That is the high elevation of making a temple, preaching to people, helping them to become strong in Krishna consciousness because it's a, it's a practical, functional line. It's, it's something real. It's not just a theoretical thing to conceive of. No, we are training devotees, we are guiding devotees, we are rescuing devotees, we are uplifting devotees, we are correcting devotees, we are creating devotee families, we are getting, creating devotee schools, we are feeding devotees. <coughs> it's a very concrete thing what this is all about. And that's why running a temple is so tough, because it's a concrete job to do. Can you do it? Can you fix Jari Kanda? Can you fix Rome's situation? Can you fix our new Brazil farm? Can you fix a real community of Vaishnavas in Poland? Can you fix uh, uh, everything perfectly in Nicaragua? You know, I'm talking to you guys because you're going out in the world and you have to fix it, if you want to fix it. Huh? You want to fix those temples in Colombia so that they are fixed up? No, fix it means repairing, and fixed up means repaired. The guy's fixed up. It's good, it's working. When something is broken, then we need to fix it. It's two different situations, broken or fixed. So do you want it fixed or do you want it broken? 
Krishna Kirtan. You want a broken mandir in Barcelona? No, so you have to fix it. <laughs> good, a good example, no? What about Nicaragua? You want to have a broken project in Nicaragua? Okay. So you want so you have to fix Nicola. That means first you have to fix yourself. You don't fix yourself. How are you how are you gonna fix the situation when you're broken condition? So then now the problem comes, we are all in broken conditions. In one way or another we all have some broken condition. So how do we fix it when we are in a broken condition? We have to fix ourselves. And how do we fix ourselves? That's what we are studying today. By associating with sattvas. That is the whole topic. You fix yourself by associating with sattvas. And then you fix your temple, your Vishnu Priyasham. You, you fix what you have to do. Then things will work. Isn't that a beautiful formula? It's so sweet. Everything is sacred. Everything is enthusiasm. And then you go and fix it. Because if you don't fix it, then it's broken. And if it's broken, then you don't like it. So you have to fix it. By what? You have to fix it a lot. Mm -hmm. Can you do it? Only by Krishna's grace we can fix it. But we can try. And if we don't try, it's worse. Worst thing is not to try. Sometimes the trials and the tests are very tough. I admit. Blah, blah. Different tests. But still we have to fix them. Like we're burning our temple. We have to fix so many things. We fix the heat, fix the kitchen, fix the order, fix the cleanliness, fix the look of the house outside. We have to fix the humidity problem. We have to fix the shimmel problem. We have to fix the relationship problem. We have to fix the uh, getting the prasadam on the table every day problem. We have to fix the going to the Arctic problem. We have to fix the getting the seminars organized problem. We have to fix the prejudice of somebody against somebody problem. We have to fix the speaking a lot and doing too little. We have to fix the sleeping too much problem. We have to fix the lost talents problem. Huh? I mean, people have great talents, but they can't bring them into action. We have to fix, my God, but all the things we have to fix in Berlin, you need, I need at least 10 fixers. Huh? But instead of fixers, I get more broken pieces. Huh? Now you fix something with broken pieces. First you have to fix the fixers, then you can fix the, the, the fixtures. It's also it's a fixtures, no? It's a, <laughs> the worst thing. If the fixtures don't work, that means the plumbing don't work, the, the, the gas doesn't work. And we have another problem, so fixing everywhere. Oh my God. No? This is community life, it's fixing. Living in broken condition of fixing. Africa, we have to fix so much. Looks like we have to fix half of Africa, you know. And why? Because white men went there to break everything. Mm -hmm. South America we have to fix. You guys have to go? Okay, I stopped the class here because I want to talk a few words with the devotees who are leaving right now. Mohana, Krishna Seva. Thank you for helping me to fix everything. I hope we make it. Well, we have to make it. If we don't make it, we break.
go by the bread, don't we? So, our job, our life is fixing. Thank you.